Hello and welcome back to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can put inside of a bun. In today's video, we're going to be learning how to approach any arrhythmia that might be slapped in front of us. So imagine this is you, maybe you're on your ward, or maybe you're just outside of an OSCE station, and suddenly, bam, you are slapped with this ECG right here and asked to interpret it. And you might be wondering, where do I even start? Is this a VT? Is this an SVT? Is this sinus rhythm? Is this AA atrial fib? And that's what today's video is all about, is finding a systematic manner to approach scary ECGs like this. So firstly, we'll be discussing what an arrhythmia is, and how do we go about spotting one. Well, an arrhythmia refers to an abnormal rhythm or irregular heartbeat. The A stands for abnormal or uh, the lack of, and rhythmia is the normal heartbeat itself. Here we can see we have a normal heartbeat, and we can see that we have P waves before each QRS complex, and that they're nice and evenly spaced apart. This essentially tells us three things. Number one, it's originating at the sinus node. Number two, it's going down the normal conductive pathway of the heart. And number three, it's beating in a rhythmic manner of roughly 60 to 100 beats per minute. So this is normal sinus rhythm. We may have a strip that looks like this. And we can see again that we have P waves and that it's going down the normal conductive pathway of the heart. But we can see they're not evenly spaced apart. So this is a sinus arrhythmia. And lastly, we may have a strip like this, where we have no P waves, and thus this is a non-sinus arrhythmia. So now we've spotted that we have an arrhythmia, how do we go about classifying it? Well, we can break down the arrhythmia by asking, is it a bradyarrhythmia or a tachyarrhythmia? A brady or slow arrhythmia is that where the ventricular rate is less than 60 beats per minute. And a tachyarrhythmia is that where the ventricular rate is more than 100 beats per minute. So now let's focus on the tachyarrhythmia side. We then have to ask, is this tachyarrhythmia coming from the ventricles or above the ventricles? In other words, is this narrow complex or wide complex? A wide complex tachycardia suggests that we are no longer conducting down the normal conductive pathway of the heart, and instead we're moving using the myocytes. And thus, this is of ventricular origin. A narrow complex tachycardia suggests that we are conducting down the normal conductive pathways. Thus, this is a supraventricular tachycardia. We can further subdivide this into asking, is it regular or is it irregular? Examples of a regular wide complex tachycardia include ventricular tachycardia and aberrant bundle branch blocks. Don't worry too much about the second one. Really, let's focus on VT for the next series of slides. Examples of a wide complex irregular tachycardia include ventricular fibrillation or pre-excitation syndrome. And we will cover this in the next slides to come. We can also break down the narrow complex tachycardias into regular and irregular. Examples of a regular narrow complex tachycardia include AVRT or AVNRT, or atrial flutter. Examples of an irregular narrow complex tachycardia include atrial fibrillation and multifocal atrial tachycardia. Again, don't worry too much about this one. We really want to focus on the more common stuff here. The bradyarrhythmias can also be subdivided into those which are wide complex and those which are narrow complex. Examples of a narrow complex bradyarrhythmia include irregular ones such as slow atrial fibrillation 
or regular ones, such as junctional rhythms. A wide complex bradyarrhythmias can include things like third degree AV blocks and idioventricular rhythm. In bold here, I have the main big common things that we should be able to spot. Great, now that we have a formula to approach any ECG or arrhythmia, let's test it out on some cases. Our first case is a 56-year-old who was admitted with severe community-acquired pneumonia and is starting to complain of palpitations for the last half an hour. Their past medical history includes COPD and hypertension, and their medications are listed below. This is what their ECG looks like. Please feel free to pause the video and have a go at diagnosing this yourself. Okay, so the first question we have to ask is, is there an arrhythmia or are we looking at a sinus rhythm? Remember that sinus rhythm is defined by a P wave before every single QRS complex. And in this ECG, I cannot make out a discernible P wave before every single QRS complex. So therefore, this is not in sinus rhythm. The next question is, is it a tachyarrhythmia or a bradyarrhythmia? Well, if we count all of the QRS complexes, we would see that there are roughly 18 of them, which gives a ventricular rate of roughly 108 beats per minute. So this is a tachyarrhythmia. The next question we ask is, is it a wide complex or a narrow complex tachyarrhythmia? Here, we can see that each QRS complex is less than three small squares. Thus, this is a narrow complex tachycardia. Is it a regular or an irregular tachyarrhythmia? And here, this is clearly an irregular tachyarrhythmia, where we can see the distance between each QRS complex is not consistent. So if we summarise, we have an irregular, narrow complex tachyarrhythmia with no discernible P waves which is classic for atrial fibrillation. Great, let's move on to our second case. We have a 28-year-old who comes to A&E with a 30-minute history of palpitations. They've got no known medical uh, history and no medications they're using at the moment. This is what their ECG looks like. Again, feel free to pause the video and have a go at diagnosing this yourself. Okay, so let's again go back to our formula. Is this sinus rhythm? Well, I can't see a P wave before each QRS complex. So therefore, this is not in sinus rhythm. Is this a tachyarrhythmia or a bradyarrhythmia? Well, here, the gap between two QRS complexes is roughly two big squares. So the ventricular rate here is roughly 150. So this is a tachyarrhythmia. Is it wide or narrow complex? The QRSs here are roughly one to two small squares. So therefore, this is a narrow complex tachyarrhythmia. And lastly, is it regular or irregular? We can see that here it is clearly regular if we put in the arrows. And the gap between each QRS complex is very consistent. So to summarize, we have a regular, narrow complex tachyarrhythmia with no P wave before each QRS complex. So the most likely diagnosis here is either an AVRT or an AVNRT. Continuing on with this case, let's say we do some vagal maneuvers to get rid of the uh, AVRT or AVNRT, and this does not work. The patient is then given 6 milligrams of IV adenosine, and he actually starts to feel worse. We can see now that he's become hemodynamically unstable. Although his chest is clear, his JVP is raised, and he's cool and clammy in the peripheries. And this is what their ECG looks like. Again, feel free to pause the video and have a go at diagnosing this yourself. Now, I know this is a very scary ECG to look at, 
But again, let's just take a step back and let's go through it systematically. Is it in sinus rhythm? I cannot see a P wave before each QRS complex, so therefore, no, it is not in sinus rhythm. Is it tachy or bradycardic? Well, we can see this is very clearly tachycardic. In fact, if we count them, there's around about 30 to 33 QRS complexes, or a ventricular rate of roughly 180 beats per minute. Is it wide or narrow? Well, this is a more wide uh, complex tachycardia. We could definitely say it's wider than normal. It's around three small squares, maybe a bit more. And lastly, is it irregular or regular? This is clearly an irregular tachyarrhythmia. So again, let's take a step back and let's just summarize what we found. We have an irregular, wide complex tachyarrhythmia with no P waves. So what are our differentials here? Well, we have an irregular, wide complex tachycardia. Could it potentially be ventricular fibrillation? We know this is unlikely, as the patient is still awake. They may be unstable, but they're still awake. And in VF, you really don't have much of a cardiac output, so they really shouldn't be awake through that. We can say this is unlikely. The next thing it could be is an aberrant bundle branch block i.e. a bundle branch block which only becomes apparent when there is rate-related ischemia, or when the heart is pumping so fast, it doesn't have enough time to spend relaxing, and as a result, a bundle branch block develops during that time. And the other thing we have to rule out is something called pre-excitation syndrome. Pause here and have a think about why this might be likely given our case. Well, we know this gentleman had some sort of AVRT or AVNRT. We gave them adenosine, and then we got this ECG. And this is what points more towards a diagnosis of pre-excitation syndrome than anything else, and I'll go on to explain it in the next slide. But regardless, how do we manage this patient? Following the ALS algorithm, we can say that they have a tachyarrhythmia, which is unstable, as they are hemodynamically unstable. So they would require DC cardioversion. So why does pre-excitation syndrome occur? Well, in order to understand this, we really have to understand three things. Number one, how does electricity travel around the heart? Very, very simple overview of it. Number two, why adenosine works. And number three, this idea of an accessory pathway. So usually, let's say we have a normal AVRT where we have this focus around the AV node and it's sending lots and lots of impulses down our AV node, causing our heart to go very fast. But the AV node itself is quite clever in that it has a refractory period. And as a result, it will only allow a certain number of signals to pass through. How we usually get rid of this is by blocking the AV node using adenosine. And by blocking the AV node, we stop the impulses reaching the ventricles, we do a great reset on the heart, and as a result, boom, our AVRT or NRT is completely gone. But where the matter gets very muddled is if we have this accessory pathway in diseases such as Wolf, Parkinson, White, which doesn't have as much of a refractory period. And as a result, the signals which could not initially get down the AV node now can go completely insane and go down the accessory pathway and cause very, very high ventricular rates. Okay, let's move on to our next case. We have a 67-year-old man who was treated for an antralateral STEMI. He is now complaining of acute onset palpitations. His past medical history includes ischemic heart disease, diabetes, and hypertension, and his medications are listed below. His 12 V DCG looks like this. So again, feel free to pause the video and have a go at interpreting this. So the first question is, is this in sinus rhythm? No, it's not in sinus rhythm as we cannot see any specific P waves before each QRS complex. Is it tachycardic or bradycardic? This is clearly tachycardic, 
with a rate of roughly 150 beats per minute, as it's roughly two big squares between each QRS complex. Is it wide or narrow? This is very clearly a wide complex tachyrhythmia. And lastly, is this regular or irregular? This is a regular. So if we were to summarize, what we have is a regular wide complex tachycardia with no discernible P waves. So the most likely diagnosis here is ventricular tachycardia. Okay, so let's do two final cases. So our next case is a 68-year-old man with an inferior MI who feels weak and experienced one episode of syncope. His past medical history is listed below, and so are his medications. His ECG looks like this. Again, feel free to pause the video and have a go at diagnosing this yourself. So firstly, is this ECG in sinus rhythm? Well, unlike our previous ECGs, we can actually see some P waves. But you'll notice that not each P wave is followed by a QRS complex. In fact, they're all over the place, aren't they? There's one here and one here, and it's almost as if they're not being followed by a, a P wave. So therefore, no, this ECG is not in sinus rhythm. Is it tacky or bratty? Well, this is profoundly bratty. This is around about a ventricular rate of roughly 36 beats per minute. As you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six QRS complexes. Is it wide or is it narrow complex? Well, the QRSs are quite wide. They're around about three and maybe a bit more. If you look in leads V2 and V5, they're quite wide. Is it regular or irregular? Well, in relation to the P waves, the QRSs are irregular, but the QRSs themselves, in relation to each other, are regular. So in essence, we have a regular, wide complex bradyarrhythmia with no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. So what's the most likely diagnosis here? The most likely diagnosis here is third degree AV block. Okay, so our final scenario looks at you being the team leader of a cardiac arrest call, and the defibrillator shows this rhythm. This is something we should be able to spot very quickly, but just following our algorithm, we can ask, is it in sinus rhythm? No, because we can't make out any P waves. Is it tacky or bratty? Well, it's clearly very tacky. In fact, we can't even work out how quickly it's going. We just know it's very quick. Is it wide or narrow complex? It's clearly quite wide complex. Is it regular or irregular? Well, it's very irregular. In fact, we can't even work out where one QRS ends and one the other one begins. So to summarize, we have an irregular wide complex tachyarrhythmia with no discernible P wave. So the most likely diagnosis here is ventricular fibrillation. What's the next step? Following the ALS algorithm, we will give a desynchronized shock and continue with CPR. Thank you so much for watching the video. Also, massive thank you for the amount of support we've seen. We're up to 1,500 subscribers now. Uh, please feel free to share the video, subscribe. Um, any question, obviously, leave it down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can.